Well, uh, I, I am reliably told that it is six o'clock, so um, I'll start uh, this meeting uh, of the of the cabinet. Um, I'm uh, chairing this meeting this evening because the uh, leader and the chief executive uh, have been called to an urgent meet meeting uh, with Lancashire leaders and the uh, deputy chief medical officer at the cabinet office. Uh, I understand that that will take about 45 minutes, so uh, the leader will uh, join us then. Um, if I can just uh, sort of go through these welcome introductions and sort of read this script out, um, which is, it seems to be the norm these days when we're having this, uh, these hybrid meetings. Um, well, thank you for attending this virtual meeting of the Cabinet. Um, on Wednesday the 14th of October 2020. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Councillor Paul Foster. Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> uh, my name is, is Councillor Mick, Mick Chitherington. Um, I'm the Deputy Leader of the, of the Council. Uh, present with me... Pre I mean... Can I ask anybody who's dialing in to listen to this script? But while, while, while I'm reading it, if you can go on mute, please. Um, uh, also present with me are officers and uh, shadow cabinet, um, and the others have been uh, um, invited to uh, dial into this meeting. Please note that this is an audio and video meeting. It is being recorded, and the stream will also be live on YouTube until we move on to the exempt reports. The web address for this is displayed on the agenda for the meeting and can be found on the Council's website. The YouTube stream will end when we go into part two of the agenda. However, the meeting will still be recorded and can be provided to any member not on the Cabinet who is interested. Uh, members are asked to keep their microphone on mute and only unmute when they wish to speak. If you do not mute yourself, the moderator will do this for you. However, when you wish to speak, you will need to turn on your microphone um, and, and then speak. Members and officers present in the shield room are also asked to ensure that they keep on mute unless they are speaking and to mute themselves afterwards in order to avoid any feedback. Reports will be presented by the relevant portfolio holder, after which I will bring the item into Cabinet. If any member of the Cabinet wishes to speak on the report, you should unmute your microphone and say your name. Use the raised hand feature uh, or use the chat function on the top right hand corner to notify our moderator that you, are, you wish to speak. I will then invite you in in order. After the Cabinet has uh, considered the reports, I will invite comments from the Shadow Cabinet, after which I will bring in any members not on the committee. Any written representations from members of the public will be read out at the appropriate point. If the technology fails for any member on Cabinet, then I will adjourn the meeting for several minutes to try and resolve the issue. Or, if this is not possible, a new date and time will be organised. Uh, as all Cabinet members are present in person, there is no need for them to say that they can be seen or heard. Um, so, uh, with, with that, I mean, have, I, have I covered everything? Can we now start the meeting? Yeah, it's time to <laughs> yeah I was going to say, I'm a bit exhausted after all that. Um, Right, okay. Uh, well, if we can uh, move to uh, apologies for absence. None received. None received, thank you. Any declarations of interest? No. If we can move to the minutes of the last meeting. Is it? Thank you. Seconded. Are there any comments from the la from that meeting? No. Okay. Uh, okay. So, 
Do we sign them as a true record or we take them as a true record? Um, so, uh, moving to item four on the agenda, uh, the uh, cabinet forward plan. Um, and well, uh, members have seen seen the plan. Is there any any comments? Okay. Uh, so, do we need it? We did. We need a uh, proposal and seconder for that. For that, do we? Yeah. Seconded. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's unanimous. Uh, then we uh, move on to the uh, items that will be covered by the leader uh, once he uh, returns. Um, and so we will move to uh, agenda item nine, um, which uh, I uh, will introduce. Um, well, I, I mean, I bring forward uh, this uh, leisure and sports uh, facilities strategy. Uh, the first uh, we uh, first ever, or at least the first one for some uh, considerable time. The strategy lays out what we intend to deliver, uh, the objectives set out in our uh, corporate plan, uh, and it also sets out how we feel is the best way of achieving our desire to make uh, life happier by prior, prioritizing physical and mental well-being. Uh, the aims of the strategy are simple. Uh, we want the provision of leisure activities to be there to enable all of our residents, young or old, whatever their abilities, to be able to participate in the leisure pursuits of their choice, whether that's a sporting activity or whether it's a simple walk in the park, whether that is at the highest level of performance or just for fun. A healthy, well-balanced lifestyle benefits us all individually and collectively, and we want to remove the barriers that exist that dissuade people from taking exercise and making it easier for people to engage. Uh, I hope members will uh, share with me in welcoming how the strategy has been uh, presented. Uh, we've looked at uh, where we are now, uh, our, what our future needs are, where we want to be, and it sets out how we're going to get there. Uh, we are looking to develop a new uh, leisure facility that will provide a hub for leisure within the borough. Um, we're looking to develop a uh, playing pitch hub, um, and that will become, we'll go into that in more detail in another item on the agenda. Uh, we're looking to develop and promote the concept of uh, leisure local, this involves working with partners like schools, sports clubs, churches, community groups to explore and exploit the uh, facilities available, to release those facilities uh, uh, for community use, giving local people the opportunity to take part and engage in activity within their locality. Uh, in pursuing uh, that concept, uh, we will be endeavouring to tackle another one of our fundamental objectives of addressing the health inequalities that exist within the borough. So the strategy is being looked at, it has to be looked at in the round. It details what we propose to do to achieve objectives of making lifestyle choices for our residents easier to make. Uh, and the strategy should be seen within the context of being part of a range of measures that we are bringing forward uh, to build community wealth and enhance the quality of life uh, of our residents. Clearly, we will be bringing further uh, forward further reports uh, to Cabinet and Council to seek approval and guidance on how the strategy can uh, be delivered. Uh, and that indeed will be starting tonight with a um, issue relating to the playing pitch hub. So I'm delighted to commend uh, this uh, report and strategy uh, to, uh, to to Cabinet, uh, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Any questions from the Shadow Cabinet? No. 
Any questions from members not on the uh, cabinet? Council Michael Green. Thank you, Councillor Tiverington. Um, can I, I welcome a lot of the items that are, that are in this strategy? Um, and I do place a significant importance on the provision of leisure facilities um, across South Fribble. I've just got two or three questions, if I may. Uh, one of them is with regard to this um, central hub that you are talking about uh, providing at the tennis centre, um, which will, will be a welcome addition. But I am somewhat concerned if that means that there will no longer be squash facilities elsewhere in the borough if we're, if we're talking about centralising all facilities to that site. So, so some clarification on that would be helpful, please. Um, and then I've just got um, a couple, couple of small queries. So on page 20, um, I think the wording is slightly wrong because it, it makes reference to consideration of the replacement of Brownlee St Mary's High School and Sports College. I'm assuming you're referring to the sports facilities rather than replacing the school. Um, and a query about on page 16, um, there's a map of South Fibble. This is a, a small point, but nevertheless, nevertheless an important one. Um, it shows a map of where the current facilities are located, uh, but that map uh, sets out the ward boundaries, um, which have not been in place for about six years now. So I'm just wondering if we could update that map with the present ward boundaries on, which will make it clearer for, for members and residents uh, to actually see where facilities are. Thank you. Uh, well, yes, I mean, yes and yes. I mean, I, I don't know if I can see the the map, but I mean, if it, is, if, it, if it has got the old uh, words on, yeah, we'll make sure that that is, uh, is, is updated. Yeah, thanks. OK, um, in relation to, uh, yeah, we're not replacing the, uh, the school. Um, we, we'll be looking to replace the, uh, well, we'll be looking to en enhance the facilities that are there. Uh, in relation to uh, the rackets, I don't think uh, the rackets hub that we are looking at I don't think any decision has been made, but I mean, I think what we're, we're seeking to do within the strategy is to make sure that there are centres where people can go and, and, uh, and you know, pursue uh, the uh, leisure activity that they've, they've chosen. Um, and in some cases, it might not be uh, opportune to offer, uh, you know, things like squash at two or three locations, it may be that there will be some centralisation in terms of uh, the uh, the rackets sport, but you have to uh, look at the, um, the the uses that is currently uh, taking place there um, when you're developing uh, the strategy going forward. But at this stage, it is a strategy. Um, I think it's setting out the vision that we want in terms of leisure, making access easy for people to. Uh, to, to access, uh, to, well, making it easy for people to access activity. Um, and, you know, along the way, as we're delivering it, there will, will be a take cognizance of what, you know, people are saying and what residents are saying. Uh, that, you know, and if we can deliver what, what people uh, are asking us to deliver, we will do so. But, I mean, I would ask you to look at the strategy in the round and what we're seeking to achieve here. Okay, anybody else? Councillor Clark? Thank you, Chair. I, I noticed that it, there's an echo there. Right, I'm getting, I'm getting an echo when I was on the big sorry. Um, under the um, consultation, it says extensive. But only five residents made a return, which is a poor return. The question I wanted to ask was, uh, amongst these 500, uh, has the disabled uh, community been represented? Well, in the, in the consultation, uh, we, uh, we, we would leave the consultation open to uh, everybody. I can say that we have had uh, discussions uh, with people who represent 
uh, disabled um, groups. Um, but whatever was said in, in the consultation, I can assure you that when, we, when I um, reported on, or when I introduced the strategy, uh, and I can re-emphasize it, is that what we are seeking to do is to make sure that activity is uh, available to everybody. And that means young, old, able, disabled, whether or not they are, you know, um, you know, at the high level of performance or whether or not they just want to take exercise. I think you've got to look at it. The strategy is designed to make sure that people are given every opportunity to exercise because we all know what the health determinants are. And I mean, and that's why I said it's got to be seen in, in the round because people, it's, you know, uh, it's got to be easy for people to, uh, to to take exercise, and where there are barriers for people to be to you know, avail themselves of exercise, we've got to be seeking to uh, to break them down. Anybody else? Councillor Howarth. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Clark did almost beat me to it here. Um, it is a little unfortunate that looking through the strategy document, um, everybody appears to be able-bodied um, and looks younger than me, to be honest. But, uh, I mean, I would hope that we would encourage disabled sport um, and it would be useful in any future publication if there was some indication that we do, um, if only by mixing the photographs up and, uh, and showing what we are doing for disabled people. I mean, there is a reference to over 65s and as somebody who is just over 65 with uh, some joints 60 years younger than the others, um, provision for, for elderly people as well would, would uh, be welcome. But as I say, the, the pictorial content of this is very much able-bodied younger people. Okay, well, we'll take that on board. Well, I mean, I, I can do reassure members is that this strategy is designed for everybody, right across young, old, disabled, abled, um, whatever, is that the, the thrust of it is to make it easy for people to be able to exercise. I mean, and some, some like to do that within the gym, some like to do it on their own, some like to sort of, you know, do yoga, before, uh, performance arts and all that. So the thing is, is that in delivering the strategy, I can assure you that everybody will be consulted. And the thing is, is to maximise the opportunity for our residents. Yeah. Councillor Phil Smith. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you. Um, it, it very much the same focus. I didn't really want to talk about this now, but now we're talking about um, disabled people and excluding people from sport and leisure. Um, with regard to the uh, the plain pitch hub, um, it, it, I mean, it directly says there that physical activity focused on women, young people, people from low income backgrounds, people from different ethnicities, um, a diverse. Yeah, that in itself excludes a lot of other people. I think maybe a reword of that and a reword of the strategy would uh, would be helpful. And doing exactly what you're saying, that nobody's excluded and everybody is included, and, and the whole thing is going to be inclusive. Um, with regard to the um, squash, um, <clears throat> um, well, that, that's a good thing. I mean, um, squash was my uh, first sport for about 30 years. Um, still feel as though I could have a game now, but there we go. Um, and the uh, squash courts at Leyland Leisure Centre are in, were in quite good condition last time I went on there. Um, they're the only ones that are glass backed, and glass squash courses need to be <coughs> glass backed. There's no doubt about that. Um, the, most of the other squash courts have now been turned into, in our facilities, into um, either a dance studio or a table tennis thing or a weights room or whatever it might be. So those are no longer really active squash courts as such. Um, 
I've got a whole host of things, and some of the things I think I'll perhaps have a chat to you after the, after the meeting, if you don't mind. Uh, but there's a whole host of things, uh, certainly with regard to strategies. There was strategy, I think, 2014, strategy 2015, I've looked at. I've got one here for 2017 to 2022. I've got another one from 2018 to 2023. Councilor, any, so, any comments on this strategy then? Um, okay, let's take it's a comment on your comment, Chair. If you don't mind, it's a comment on your comment saying that we never have a strategy or whatever we have. Um, it's just that you probably can't find it. Um, <clears throat> just with regard to um, that, um, um, and it, there's a mention of um, sports halls and um, that it exceeds supply. Um, it actually doesn't exceed supply. All the evidence that we had before. Um, does not make that happen. The problem is that schools, when you add all the uh, <clears throat> sports facilities up, you add them all together and you're adding all these ones at the schools, which well, are... Councillor Cal 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 Smith, have you got a question? It's not just, this is not just about questions. This is about making comments well, as well yeah, on, no, on the report. You, you, so it's not you, a question, you, you, it's a report. I'll turn told, it, if you want me to turn it into a question, yeah, I will Councillor do. Smith, please. Respect the chair. I am respecting the chair. But uh, have you got a question? Please respect the questioner as well. Have you got, have you got a question? It, it's not about questions. It, it's about um, on the report itself. Okay. Well, okay. What's, the, what's the point that you want to make on the report? Okay. So, so there's there's a report in on there, and it says there are going to be two 3G pitches. That's that's um, in all the previous reports that we've had for FMG and all the various other people have reported. Um, it was four 3G pitches. That's what we were wanting, and that's what the shortfall was. Uh, question is, what has changed from four to two? That's one question. If you'd like to answer that to start with. Well, I mean, oh, I've got a whole host of them, if you like. <clears throat> right, okay, Penwitham, with regard to, to Penwitham um, undertaken options appraisal, it's the, with regard to the dual use agreement at Penwitham, is that going to be ongoing? Because that's a really important part of the facilities strategy going forward. Uh, well, in, in, in <coughs> relation to the uh, playing pitch, a uh, hope which we, which we will be talk, which is another item on on the agenda. Uh, KKP did do a survey of all pitches within within Lancashire, uh, and they said that we were short of two three G pitches. Um, and I'll I'll cover that when we when we talk about yeah, yeah. the the playing the playing pitch uh, hub. Um, in real, sorry, what was the second bit, piece that he's done? Um, well, there's several of them. Penwitham Home, uh, uh, not mentioned in the strategy. Penwitham Home, thing. but I mean, you mentioned the dual... The dual I, I, I did, yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. Well, well, I mean, that is that is coming to an end um, because the, the, the school have, have pulled out of that. Uh, Penwitham Home uh, is, not, is not mentioned in there. No, it's but, not. Um, but the, the, I mean, when we, we haven't mentioned everything that that you know is going on at the moment or what's going on. It is a strategy, and it's a dynamic document, isn't it? I mean, as we go towards implementing it, is that you know we're going to meet you know certain things that come, that come to us that we will you know have to adapt and adopt. I mean, and what I'm saying is that in, within that strategy. When we come forward with suggestions, I mean, we will bring that forward to cabinet or to council. No, I'm just surprised Penwitham Home particularly hasn't had a mention um, because it is um, highly regarded um, by the uh, Football Association uh, as a football area of regional significance and it's regional significance, not just local. Um, yeah, yeah. But I mean, equally, I mean, there's probably more games being called off at Penwitham Home and have been played on it just recently. <clears throat> so it is, a, it, it, it is a particular problem, but what I want to do is to discuss the strategy. Obviously, there will be individual uh, issues within, within, uh, within the borough that will need to be addressed as we move forward. Okay, I won't ask any more questions now, but I was okay. saying when I came, that when okay. I first opened up, it's what's not in the strategy rather okay. than what's in it, where well, the questions are coming from. All right, thank you. 
Anybody else? <coughs> yeah. Uh, on um, page six point twenty, uh, there's an interesting note there about the, uh, the the swimming pools and sports halls well used and performing well uh, when compared to national benchmarks, and it mentions a figure producing an income of over one thousand pound per square meter. I'm just wondering, is that a, that's the gross income? Is there any costs, and maybe what's the net income? Uh, to be honest with you, I haven't got a clue. I yeah. mean, that, that is something that the uh, FMG uh, calculates and there will be a national measurement. Uh, and what what they're saying in there is that, uh, you know, in, in, it's well performing compared, compared to what's happening nationally. Okay. Councillor Margaret Smith. Thank you, Mr Chairman. There's some very interesting things in here. Um, I'm sure they're, they're all very welcome. Um, I'm just a little concerned about something you just said um, minutes ago when you said that the primary high um, dual use, they have pulled out of it. Um, is that official that they have actually pulled out of the dual use at this moment in time? Because the actual um, dual use doesn't finish for, I think, probably another 18 months until the contract with Serco finishes. Um, could you just elaborate on that for me, please? Yeah, they've given they've give, uh, notice that they want want to pull out of it, out of that agreement. So in that case, if the, that's understandable, I think we all expected that. Um, but obviously, we have as uh, a council quite a considerable asset uh, and quite a considerable investment within um, the Priory High. Will the special will another paper be coming that tells us what will happen to the assets and how we're going to deal with them? Um, will that be coming in the near future? Yes. Before the dual use ends, or any time scales on that? Well, no, there's no time scales, but we're, we're obviously considering it, and it will be. I mean, with the change in the dual use agreement, we will we will need to sort of have a look within the strategy how we can move forward and deliver deliver the strategy. Uh, <coughs> we, we may be looking for. You know, we might be looking to develop a, a hubs within 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 Penn with them. Um, we might well, obviously there are uh, there are premises there, and we do have a, we still have an interest, uh, but we will report that to, uh, to to cabinet. You know, when there has been a definite decision made. That's very interesting because uh, I've read in here. Obviously, I've read this, and um, it talks about Ben and Keris. Um, which is down Factory Lane, which is quite an interesting place, and I'm sure that it will be a big asset to us when we get it. But it isn't actually central, really, to the area of Pemberton, uh, particularly. It is quite a hike, even from where we live, and we're nearer to that probably than um, we are to Priory High. So it, it will be um, interesting to, to see your strategy as to how you're actually going to um, make the community hub within the Pemberton area work. Thank you. Thank you. Neil, do you want to come in? You're muted. Sorry, Chair. Just to, to clarify, Councillor Smith, the dual use agreement uh, ends at the end of March and on with the Serco contract. Um, and we're working with the school on the fact they want to take the um, facility in house. But I kind of saw, uh, Councillor Smith, that um, she's quite right. Community use is hugely important at the Priory, and we have a commitment to work with the school. But that community use of the school facilities, notably the 3G pitch in the sports hall, will continue. Uh, they're very, they're very keen to continue to be a, a community school. So just a clarification on that, Tim. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry, can I? Sorry. Works different. Good evening, um, Councillor Titherington. Uh, just a question about this uh, not excluding everyone. Um, I need, need some reassurance that um, access to these leisure centres are not 
very good for everyone. As Councillor Smith has just said, uh, lots of the leisure se centres at the moment and leisure facilities are not on bus routes. And so I think it will um, exclude lots of people who haven't um, access to a car or the facilities are not in walking distance, especially where I live. Thank you. I think you're absolutely you're absolutely right. I mean, um, in terms of um, of buses, I mean, I think that that's that that is a problem for a number of people in able to get to sort of a number of different amenities. But um, I, I think we fully fully recognise that, and that's why I emphasise this concept of uh, leisure local, um, because as you say, I mean, not everybody has got access to a car. Not everybody is prepared to travel, uh, um, so we've got to make we've got to drill down to make sure that these sorts of the facilities are there in within the locality. And I think that that's what we're trying to really get across in terms of this strategy. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Can I then? Uh, Asked uh, the uh, cabinet to confirm that we uh, are adopting this strategy. Nobody against. Okay. Thank you for that. I'm sorry about that, everybody. Um, well, maybe not so sorry, though, to those people who are listening. But uh, anyway, I was, what I was saying is that I am pleased pre to uh, present uh, this report um, and uh, that the KKP had, uh, as it says in the report, had uh, conducted a review and come up with a playing pitch strategy, I, I think, for uh, Lancashire. And within that, uh, they identified that there was a need for two, uh, three G uh, pitches within within the borough, um, and uh, I think we've been looking. I mean, prior to this administration and during this administration, for a suitable site where we could uh, locate that. We've been working with uh, uh, Lancashire FA, who. Um, at one stage, we're looking for to to relocate, and we thought if they relocated within the borough, then there might be an opportunity for us to uh, get uh, pitches uh, on their relocation. Anyway, that that's fell fell through. We've looked at other sites. Um, and many of the sites that we've considered are prohibitive because of uh, of of the cost. Uh, in other words, they're too expensive. Uh, then we identified uh, that uh, there was land there where we could fit two uh, um, 3G pitches in at uh, uh, Bamba Bridge Leisure Centre. Um, and I, quite frankly, I mean, when we did discover this, I was absolutely delighted with it. Uh, and I'm also sort of really excited uh, with the proposal that's coming forward uh, this, this evening. Um, and there are opportunities there. I mean, uh, we have been working with uh, the uh, Football Foundation um, and that, that would bring up some uh, real opportunities for funding. Um, and if it all goes well, I mean, it could be up to uh, just under a million pound in funding from the Football uh, Foundation. So if you look at the plans, there is, they are talking about the creation of a new changing room facility um, within there, which would have a cafe, um, and it would also have a cafe and a social room where clubs could use for 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 meetings. Uh, I think uh, when the pitches are in use, 
uh, that will be um, a really good revenue earner because if you look at these playing pitch hubs, um, when they're being used, I mean, if they're being used by young people or others, I mean, you know, parents and supporters and everybody else usually uh, takes um, takes the opportunity to have have a drink or or eat something. So, um, so I I just think that this you know is a, is a tremendous uh, opportunity for us. I mean, if you look at it, it will it, it will come out of the four point three million uh, that we'd allocated for this. I mean, I am really hopeful that if we do get if we do get that funding uh, is that and it comes in at you know 2.8 2.5 2.8 million is that we will have uh, monies that we could possibly uh, invest in another pitch because I think the future is if the future for football uh, anyway is in uh, 3G pitches I mean and if you look at the um, the record over recent recent years, um, uh, the uh, number of games that have been called off on grass pitches uh, has been tremendous. And I know that the uh, the FA nationally uh, is pushing for younger uh, uh, people to be playing on uh, 3G pitches. So the facilities there, I think it's a great project. I think it's one to, to whet the appetite. appetite. And uh, I, I, uh, I wholeheartedly recommend it and hope that we can get on. It does mention in there, there may be, uh, a, you know, an issue uh, related to the um, great crested uh, newts. Um, um, and we hope that the ecologists looking at that, uh, that we can we can resolve that. Hopefully, um, that will, if we can resolve that, that issue, it will um, determine whether or not we can go forward with applying for the for the funding uh, earlier rather than than later. But tremendous and exciting uh, project, uh, and as I say, I recommend it. So, um, anybody on the shadow cabinet want to make any comments? Thank you very much. Anybody want to come in on that? Councilman Margaret Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's very exciting, uh, as you quite rightly said. It was something that was um, something that was going forward in the last administration. Um, we were just a case of looking for somewhere, uh, a site, a suitable site. Um, I see the plan now that where the site is to be located, which is in the uh, play area at the Withy Grove Park. My Concern about that is at this moment in time is that it is right up against the motorway, um, and I assume that there has been some calculation done as to how much pollution will be coming off that motorway uh, towards the pitches, um, and therefore that that will be uh, fed back to us in due course. I'm hopeful that you'll make sure that we get that report. And the other one is as regards our friends, the great crested newt. Um, I'm not awfully sure because I'm not an ecologist, but I understand there are only certain times of the year when you can actually check whether these um, <coughs> great crested newts are about. Um, and as we're going into obviously October, November, um, is that going to be a difficulty? Um, will we have to wait till the spring uh, to actually get somebody on site to actually check whether they mm. are about? Uh, and if that is so, will that affect the bid uh, into the Football Foundation, which I understand is supposed to go in in January. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, it, it will. I mean, you, you, you're quite right. There are only certain times of the year that you can sort of, I mean, we don't even know if they're there. I mean, so that's what's, uh, that's what's got to be done is to, do, is to do a survey to see if they are there and they can only be carried out at certain times of the, of the year, as you said. Um, I think the, the issue is, is whether or not we can move forward with planning permission on the basis of um, that we are going to conduct a survey or whether we need to conduct the survey before we go to planning. So, um, and if, if, it is, if it is the latter, then yeah, it will uh, delay progress. Yeah. Yeah. Boom. 
Uh, on the pollution, well, I mean, the football found it. We, the consultants from the football found it. Uh, the consultants that we used uh, have said that, you know, it is adequate. It fulfills all the issues. We had discussions with, with, with planning and well, no, nobody's happy with the possibility of of, of, uh, um, of pollution, but it, I mean, they are satisfied that you know they, it, there won't be any ill effects from uh, pollution from the motorway. So, just to come back on that, Mr. Chairman, um, do I take it from that that you've already taken some readings down there to make sure that it is um, okay? <laughs> Well, there's been uh, well, there's been ex extensive um, discussions and consultations. Uh, Some readings being taken to make sure that it is correct and safe. I, I, I don't know, to be honest with you. Is, uh, is Neil on? Yeah. Yeah, Councillor Smith makes a, a, a good point. I mean, we, um, there, there are lots of issues about the next to motorway which we need to take, take on board. Pollution, lighting, noise, and all those are being looked at, working closely through surveys and working with highways uh, through our planning department. And we'd be happy to, um, as, I, as that work is completed, um, you know, share that information with, with them with the councillor um, as we stand at the moment uh, the only red flag that we've had in all the surveys and work is is as chairman have said uh, which is the great question which could hold, which could hold up the application to the football foundation by three months but yeah we'd be happy to talk to Edward, councillor smith on the surveys that have been carried out because she's quite right the m6 is the m6 Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I too was a bit surprised under air quality implications that this issue wasn't mentioned because it does say uh, we'll be taken on board with the Council's air quality plan, which implies something's uh, going to be done. Uh, but uh, I just wonder, it's got that this development uh, must be impacted by uh, the the pollution which arises from the motorway. And I think it's an important point to raise that. And it's missing from the report. And can I just ask, um, what is the energy source for the, um, uh, the changing room uh, complex there? Is it going to be carbon neutral? Uh, I well, I, I would hope so. I mean, we will, we will have to sort of... Uh, we, we will bear, bear that in mind, but in terms of the uh, the pollution, I think, uh, you know, uh, the officer has responded to that. I would say that if you go up and visit the site, there is a playground there that is, I mean, is always, always uh, full of young people and parents. It's really, it, I've never seen one that's sort of so uh, well used. Um, so, um, if there is problems with regard to air pollution, then I will be highly concerned about what effects it's having on on the, the, those the, the, the children and uh, uh, and indeed you know anybody using the football the football pitches. But yeah, it's a it, 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 it is a, an issue. Uh, thanks, sir. I mean, really interesting um, that these comments are being made. I mean, motorways tend not to be that great polluters because the traffic tends to move on them. Um, and I would I would suggest that if you're looking for pollution in Bamber Bridge, we all know because we've had, a, a, sorry, AQ, MAs, ACMA um, on Station Road. So if we built it near to Station Road, then the risks to uh, from traffic pollution will be much greater than they are um, by the M6. That's not to say there aren't any air quality uh, considerations, as Councillor Clark made, but I would suggest that there are far worse places we could put this in Bamber Bridge um, if we were genuinely worried about pollution affecting people playing football. Thank you. Councillor Phil Smith. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, 
just on the on the back of that, maybe it's not an air quality implication, but maybe it should go in the risk risk management area, um, because it, it will be a risk to individuals. And obviously, the football pitches are uh, about 50 metres closer to the play to to the motorway than the playground. Um, with regard to the electricity, you, you could connect it up to all the, uh, <clears throat> the, the bikes in the, uh, in the gym and produce electricity. At the moment, they produce nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, and I'll just go back to um, the, the, the requirements. Um, you know, it's been quite clear of the past that we, we, we did need um, uh, four 3G pitches. Now, maybe there's some been built, built in the borough already and that, that reduces the, the, the need for the, um, uh, the borough to, uh, to produce uh, such things. Um, we do support this, obviously. Uh, it would be a good thing going forward if we can bring it forward. Um, one question is, I suppose, is, is it um, fundamental that we actually get the Football Foundation bid? Um, will it happen if we don't get that bid? I think that's probably one question. Um, um, <clears throat> and we did have in, in, in our budget um, 4.6 million to do exactly the same thing. We were just looking for the right premises. If these are the right premises, that's great. Um, I also think that uh, any work done on the leisure centre at this time is, is, is also a, a good opportunity to, to catch up with some of that work that needs doing. In the, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Well, yeah, well, you, you hit on a good point. I mean, the fact is, is that, I mean, whether we need, you know, two or three, I mean, I, I, I would I would like, a, you know, a lot more, to be honest with you. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that, I mean, we have been looking, and I know the previous administration was looking, we have been looking for a suitable location. Um, this seems, uh, to fit the bill, uh, I, I think, uh, in terms of the cost, if you look at at the budget, um, it does mean because we we we, won't, we don't have to pay anything for uh, the land, and I think there is a real possibility of us getting funding from the football foundation. Um, if if we didn't, um, it would it would still fall within uh, the uh, the budget allocation that we've got in there, which is. I think is 4.3 million, is it, or 4.6? But I think it's 4.3 uh, million. Um, but I, I, you know, as I said before, ideally, if we can uh, get that funding, then that gives us that that releases more money within the 4.3 million to have a look uh, elsewhere. Because I do think that the, these could be. I know it says in there that we at least break even. But I think it could be, uh, you know, a, ni a nice uh, revenue stream. Can I just come back, Chair? Yeah, yeah I mean, you talk about break even and, and all, all the reports we had previously, there's just a substantial amount of income that can be uh, generated from uh, these sort of pitches. We, well, we know that the, the, yeah. the information is there and yeah. the break even bit did worry me a bit, to be quite honest. But um, that said, just going back to the amount of money that's on, on the changing facilities and what have you, um, 800 and odd thousand pounds. Um, you're quite right you said we could probably do with more but it doesn't look as though on that site itself that there'd be any way of extending uh, the playing pitches putting another one in at a later stage or well, one in after it. that not, not on that site no 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 but the, site, the facilities the eight hundred thousand pound facility that you need will probably service three or four pitches rather than just two that's the point i'm making well, yeah, it's a, 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 but I mean, it does it does put them closer, and I think it, it does the changing rooms. It does put closer, and the facilities that will be there, I think, uh, will make it more of a revenue, a revenue earner. Anyone, anyone else? Councillor Mary Green. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just a question, really. Um, if this application goes ahead. Um, have you any idea of information of what's happening to the existing football pitch on King Street Struck Thurston Road? What plans have they got? Are they planning to still stay there or is it going to be utilised for something else? Have you got any information on that site at all? 
Uh, well, that's owned by the uh, Lancashire FA. I mean, and I, I, I mean, I think that they were looking to relocate, but they've decided to stay there. So, um, the maintenance and the use of that is is up to the uh, Lancashire FA. Councillor Turner. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Councillor, I'm, I'm aware that there's a fourth generation, fifth generation and sixth generation uh, pitches. So I just wanted to do a, a check really that the consideration or the down selection to a 3G, it's not like a software update where we've not got the latest one, is it? I don't know. Is it? Is it that the 3G is the most suitable for us? We're not getting old stuff. Uh, no, well, no, I mean, um, I think you're right. I mean, I think we're 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 on we're on to to, to 5G now, aren't we? <laughs> um, but I do. Um, I'll, before I bring uh, Neil in, I mean, what we would be uh, wanting to do is to have a surface uh, that will accommodate uh, rugby as well, um, which which is a sort of a, a soft a softer surface but uh, in terms of the, uh, the 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 generations yeah i do take on board what you're saying about the, the generations and neil uh, in, in yeah, the Chairman, uh, um Councillor Terry, it's a really good point you make and um, but it's a fantastic marketing point and i had a double check with the consultant who works um football foundation work on behalf of football foundation there is no such thing as a fourth g pitch or a fifth g pitch it is a marketing point the three the, the, the third generation um football pitch rugby pitch it is it is as far advanced as the um as the kind of technology goes but uh, I, I like you, Councillor Turner, had to double check with, with Sport England about because so many companies you know, market the idea of we've got a 5G pitch. They don't exist. It's, it, it's 3G, is the state of the art, um, top of it technology. I'm not saying that technology won't improve, but at the moment, the 3G is the, is the pitch that um, the, the, the Football Foundation recommend having. We'll, we'll make sure that it's the latest. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, yeah. anybody else? Can yeah, three G three G pitches are a rubber crumb for, for your information, and, and hockey 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 don't hockey don't like them. To be quite honest, they like the old ones. <laughs> right. Okay. Councillor Caleb Tomlinson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just to reiterate a couple of points, um, just because it's beside the M6 does not mean it's unacceptable for air quality because the M6 moves and it drags pollution along with it. I go on that park a lot and I have never seen a great crested newt not that I've looked for one, but I've never seen one. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Amelia. Um, yes, I'd just like to congratulate you, Councillor Tidrington. My house actually backs onto Withy Grove Park and I do use it a lot. And I'm so excited that this is going to happen in my ward. So just to say, thank you. Cheers, much appreciated. Okay, uh, Cabinet, can I uh, ask you to uh, 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 adopt that report? Thank you, I confirmed that, we've accepted that. Uh, I'm going to ask Councillor uh, Matthew Tomlinson to introduce the refurbishment of Hearst Grange Park Coach House in Penwitham, and that's item 11. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, we've discussed this um, long and hard, this project, so I don't intend to go into um, all of the background other than to say, obviously, um, it's been through scrutiny. The actual project itself has been through scrutiny uh, and there's been the result of uh, several, several reports to Cabinet. Uh, but what we're doing tonight is asking for permission to go ahead and spend the money. Uh, we have been out to uh, procurement. Um, the bids have been assessed um, and you can see the bids in Appendix 1 and it is intended, um, not surprisingly, if you look at the scores, to award the contract to bidder number eight. Um, and with that, I'll cease my remarks. Thank you. That's seconded. Thank you. Any questions in cameras? No. Any questions? No, on the cabinet. Councillor Howarth. Thank you, Chair. Um, I do have two or three questions, really. I mean, first of all, on behalf of the higher Penwitham councillors, both in Harrick and Priory and Broadoak, I think we're somewhat disappointed that um, there's been little briefing or consultation with us. Yes, we were sent the uh, consultation itself, along with every other member of the council and, and the town council and whatever. But if I can just give you an example, at county, for example, when, when they were building the bypass um, and when they were proposing measures through the Pemberton District Centre, I had briefings with the head of planning, with the city deal team, with officers, um, showing me plans of what they were planning to do, just taking me through it and discussing it with me. We've asked, um, is there a plan for what you're, you're going to do at Hurst Grange Playground? What equipment are you putting in? And we've had no sight of it. Um, apparently, that's the next item on the agenda. Right, okay. That this is the coach house. Oh, sorry. <laughs> right, I'll come back later. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> Council Brothers. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Is it? Um, yeah, uh, I'd just like to comment, it's, um, it, it does appear good, good value for money. Um, the original budget was 783, this is coming in at 732, which is good to see. Uh, I'm just wondering um, if we know the reason why it has come under budget. Um, is the quality the same or I'm assuming they're going to be using a, a local tradesmen, which might give local tradesmen might have more incentive to put in a lower bid maybe. I'm just wondering whether there's such a huge, huge difference between the, um, the the ranges of the bids, but it does look, does look like good value coming in at uh, cheaper than what we thought it would be. Thank you. Yeah, obviously it is pleasing that it's come in uh, under budget. Um, I think anybody who's done procurement, I mean, they don't give you a reason why the price is um, as it is, but some people really want the work. And I would suggest that somebody who's bid 900,000 for this job probably doesn't want the work anyway. Um, so, I, I, yeah, obviously really pleasing. Um, these people have worked with us before. Um, they know us, they know uh, what we're trying to do, um, which probably explains the um, amazing score they got. Um, they clearly ticked all the boxes um, and, uh, and that's why they were uh, given the contract. Uh, they've got to go ahead and deliver it now, but it is good news, yeah. Right, thank you. Councillor Ogilvy. Thank you, Chair. Um, when this was last discussed, um, Councillor Turner raised a very good pertinent point about capping the budget on this. Um, in response to her question at the time, the uh, cabinet member for finance said that he would be able to stick to the budget because if necessary the scope would be rejigged in order to stay within that budget. That was then followed by a comment from the cabinet member for leisure to say that it wasn't possible to de-scope because of the terms of the national lottery bid. So I just wondered if you'd clarified which of those members was actually correct. Thank you. Uh, well, um, I, to be honest with you, I don't remember the remark from the uh, from the uh, shadow 
uh, from the uh, uh, cabinet member for finance, but I do remember the remark that I made, uh, and that, that was true, um, is that we applied for the lottery funding on the basis of uh, the, 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 the contents of what uh, would be involved in the refurbishment of uh, the of the uh, the coach house. Uh, I think that if you remember um, the before we brought it back uh, before it was sort of called in by scrutiny. I mean the original um, bids had come in, uh, you know, cheaper than what we we expected. I mean, and you know that's what's happened this time. So. I think it's uh, it's time for rejoicing. Really, is that if we've got if we've got that that work being done up to uh, the standard that we expect for cheaper than what we uh, originally thought was 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 going to cost, I think it's uh, it's a win-win and something that we should be pleased with. Councillor Colin Clark. Thank you, Chairman. Um, when I was involved uh, with this project, developing and promoting it with the Friends of Hurst Grange, one of the issues which was raised, certainly with users of that site, was uh, catering for uh, disabled, which is a point I raised earlier. Um, can uh, the Cabinet member assure us that access um, for disabled is covered within this uh, specification? Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, tonight we're just talking about the awarding of the tender, um, but I, I, I'm i sure that Councillor Clark um, would be quite um, secure in his knowledge that we wouldn't be procuring anything that didn't apply the uh, disabled to the Disabled Discrimination Act. Um, as, as we go through this, as the plans come out, I'm happy for everybody to see um, as much as possible. Um, but this is, we're tonight talking about awarding the contract and I'd really like to stick to that. If I can just come back, Chairman, this, this was raised by the self same residents uh, uh, as to whether in fact uh, their interests would be catered for. So I, I couldn't answer that question at the time, uh, but I'll, I'll take back that answer that Councillor Tomlinson has given me. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Phil Smith. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. It's just with regard to Table 2. Um, and perhaps I could have some explanations uh, from the, the Cabinet member. Um, we've obviously got what is a, a fixed term contract of 557,000. But looking in Table 2, we've also got a building works contingency. Now, normally when somebody's uh, submitting a bid, they put in contingencies rather than us having to add, add contingencies on the top. Uh, and I think the same, I mean, the external planting and lighting, that's fairly straightforward. I can understand that. Professional fees, maybe we can understand that. Uh, other contingencies, inflation allowance, and then the one at the bottom, which is other costs, activities, interpretation of... Uh, could just do with some information on that really. The contingencies should be in the price of the bid. Um, yeah, and normally if this if this if these were contingencies for the whole project, I'd expect them to be a bit bigger than that as well. Um, now, I mean, um, if Jen wants to give you detail or if you want detail, I'm sure we can provide it. Um, but in terms of breaking that down into individual bits, I'm not I'm not able to give you those precise figures tonight, but I'm sure we can get them for you. Yeah, I, I am happy to bring the precise figures, but it was a requirement of the National Lottery that we put this contingency in as separate to the actual um, main contract work, um, that we had a, a significant contingency that we can guarantee to the National Lottery if something did happen, it's there. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, uh, I think, you know, in terms of the bid and uh, you know, what we're going to do there has been fully covered. Um, I mean, I got the grilling at, uh, <laughs> at scrutiny and I think, you know, we went into uh, every aspect that we, we possibly could at that, at that time. Okay, anybody else? No, okay. Okay, can uh, 
can we ask then to sort of confirm that report? Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, the refurbishment of the playgrounds at Hearst Grange Park, um, Hemwitham and uh, Bellis Way, Walton Lee Dale. Uh, and can I ask, I know it's got me down there, but I mean, can I ask Councillor Sue Jones to introduce that item? Thanks, Chair. Uh, the purpose of this report is to bring the two refurbishment projects before members and to seek permission to spend the allocated capital budgets and award the contract to the preferred bidder for Hearst Grange Playground. What you probably remember is that the refurbishment program ended in 2012 and was restarted in 2019 under the previous administration. <coughs> Excuse me. Leedale, Seven Stars and Worden have been completed with work on Hague Avenue due to start in the new year. We've now in, put in place a catch-up program with Hearst Grange Park and Bellis Way now at the top of the list. With regard to Hearst Grange Park, it was last refurbished in 1998. It's Penwitham's principal park and serves a wide, wide area. The proposal is to provide a modern and accessible playground for toddlers aged two to six and juniors aged seven to 12. The money to be allocated is 225,000 pounds. With regard to Bellis Way, the second recommendation is to spend the allocated £30,000 for the refurbishment of Bellis Way, Bellis Way Playground, increased to a maximum of £60,000, subject to a successful external funding bid by the local friends group. Design for the playground will be invited through the chest. Bidders will be asked to design a scheme for the two budgets. At this point, can I say there has been some concerns raised about the lack of consultation on the Hearst Grange project. Um, and after discussion earlier with the cabinet colleagues and officers, I feel it's important that ward members and com community hub chairs are more actively involved in the consultation process to ensure that their communities are more, more involved particularly in the final design process. I think many of us will remember at a council meeting um, previously when it was announced that Seven Stars, Leedale and Hague Avenue were going to be refurbished and nobody had been consulted on that. So I'm very anxious taking on points that, uh, that have been raised that we consult with ward members and the, the chairs um, as we go along. Incidentally, three play areas where we've been looking um, at the moment, I've already met with the ward members, met on site, looked at the site, and I, as far as I'm concerned, that is the way forward, and that's what I will be doing in the future. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Uh, that report seconded. Thank you. Right. Any any members of the cabinet wish to make any comments? No. Uh, anybody? Councillor Howard. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I've got two resolutions now. One is to go to Specsavers tomorrow, and the other one is to get a bigger screen so I can actually see what I'm reading. Um, can I thank Councillor Jones for, for that assurance that, that's just been given? Um, because I don't think we're asking to be involved in designing the equipment or whatever. We just like a briefing so when residents ask us, we've got some answers. Um, and I don't think that, that's unreasonable. There are just a couple of things in the report because we could have been here all night if we, if we started with all the questions we had yesterday and the day before, which in the main have now all been answered in, in emails. But there are just a couple of things there. Uh, the consultation carried out and the outcome of the consultation. Um, I would have found it useful to have a spreadsheet of what comments had been made, what um, what had come back in, in terms of that consultation, um, and what we got off um, social media. I mean, I, I follow South Ribble's uh, Facebook site. I, I, I follow the chatter on all the sort of Penwitham Facebook sites, 
and you can pick up a feeling. And if there's one unfortunate thing um, in doing an excellent project at Hurst Grange Park, it seems to have prompted everybody to tell us what's wrong with all the other playgrounds. Because um, it's a case of why are you doing that? Why aren't you doing this? And you can't do everything at once and there will have to be a long-term program. Um, the only other comment I've got is that I am a bit taken aback that we don't seem to be able to have access to a plan of, of the actual playground itself and what equipment uh, is being proposed to go in there. So is there a site plan? Have we got any knowledge of what the equipment is? Has the cabinet seen it? Or are you effectively allocating £225,000 blind before you know what it is you're spending it on? Uh, yeah, again, I, I take the point about um, your, your suggestion of a spreadsheet of, of, of comments and so on. Um, I, I think we have to be be much more involved with, with ward members and let them see. Um, can I ask Jennifer uh, to, to comment on the design, please? Yeah, there is a design and there's a site plan available. <clears throat> we can send that through um, as soon as we get permission, obviously, from this report. Do you want to come back on that? Well, is the answer then that yes, you are agreeing to £225,000 blind because you haven't seen a site plan or what the equipment is you're purchasing? Uh, Chair, could I come in as, as finance portfolio holder? We we do, um, I've, I've said, um, and Councillor Ogilvy referred to it uh, earlier, it's always my first point of call that we agree a budget that we can afford for a project and then the project has to fit that budget. It has to, because we have to run this council's finances in a sensible, sustainable way. We've agreed a budget and then we can consult on what we can get for that budget. Um, it's not a case of agreeing the budget blind. We know how much playgrounds cost. We know how much Lee Dale Green cost. We know how much Seven Stars cost. Uh, we know how much it cost us to do Word and Park. So we agree this is a sum of money that we can sensibly afford to spend on a major, one of our major playgrounds. And then we see what we can get for it and we'll be happy uh, to consult if members uh, feel they have um, experience and expertise to add to that consultation. Um, but it, from my point of view, um, I, and I said it, it you know, uh, although I was corrected uh, by Councillor Tithington on Hearst Grange uh, Lodge, uh, and I'm happy to be corrected when I'm wrong, um, but I, it's a message that officers have got from me on Word and Hall. The budget has been agreed and that's what we will end up spending. Or if we can, we'll spend less, obviously, but we're not letting budgets run away uh, and people keep coming back and saying, oh, actually, we need to find more money because this council has agreed the budget and that is what will guide the project. Thanks for that. Uh, can I just add, add, uh, just add a little bit to that? Uh, the email that, that Jennifer Mullin sent to Councillor Turner, uh, in, in fact, in the last paragraph says, the bid is designed for the playground will be publicised to members if we receive permission to award from Cabinet at tonight's meeting. So that will be available. And, I th and there are some, some small points here about some of the, 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 the tower and so on. So, and I'm quite happy to meet with you if you want to discuss the design um, at, at any point. I'm, I'm happy to do that. And I'm sure Jennifer would be as well. As long as it doesn't exceed 225,000. Yeah. Well, if I can very just quickly come back, because my understanding of reading all the reports is that you've gone out to tender on the understanding that 225,000 is the budget and you've invited tenders on that basis. What can you provide us for 225,000? So the question of going over that budget, I, I, I don't understand where that comes in. And if we've had one bid and they've told us what they can provide for 225,000, what is the problem with seeing it? I don't think there is a problem with seeing it, is there? Yeah, but that, 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 that can be shared with, with, uh, with, with members. I think that's, that, that's what I've just said from, from the email. 
we're happy to, we will be happy to to take a look at it and okay. allow members to to take a look at it okay we'll do that. Do, would that you board. like me to arrange a meeting so that we can we can go through it yeah 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 okay no, yeah councillor turner yeah thank you chair yeah, um, Councillor uh, General, thank you very much for uh, your comments and you obviously you get where we were coming from and uh, you've said that you, you, you'll interface with us uh, in future uh, on, on other projects and keeping us up to date, especially as I am, and Councillor Councillor Hancock are the ward members uh, for that area. Plus we've got our eyes and ears on the ground and, and we get a lot of feedback from residents about the status of some of the other playgrounds. Uh, I just want to uh, get absolute confirmation from you. I know you said you'd consult with us, but what we're, we're expecting here going forward in the future, and not just for ourselves in Penwortham, but other areas of South Ribble, is that the officers will engage with us at the earliest opportunity and we go with them on the journey uh, on these projects. Because uh, you did say you'd engage, which is fine, but I want a commitment from the officers that in future they're going to give us briefings from the start obviously if it coincides with an election that, that's not going to be possible but we just don't feel that we were carried along on this journey at all and we just found out too many things too late which we didn't even know about so i'm talking about the officers now giving a commitment to consult at the earliest opportunity not not yourself thank you yeah well i mean i can give the i can give you that that assurance on behalf of the cabinet is that that going forward we will ensure that all all members are and particularly ward members uh, will be consulted on issues in in their, their wards i can give you that assurance yes. I, th I think we already have started doing that with the next round of 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 play areas that we that we're looking at that uh, we are engaging much more than we did before um and i'm happy to um, to to speak with with the officers again to make sure that that happens. They're very very supportive and they work very very hard. But I do take the point that we haven't perhaps engaged as as well as we should have done. Okay, that's. And I have apologised to Councillor Turner for that mistake. Okay, well it's well recognised. We'll take that on board. I can just say that just just to say from an officer's point of view, we are committed to consulting. Yeah. Councillor Ogilvy. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, just to say I, I welcome improvements to any playground across the borough, uh, and I hope that it will take account of uh, all abilities and disabilities in terms of the equipment that, that goes into these. Um, however, I've got, I've got a concern about basically how this contract is going to be awarded. Um, I think question one is, why on earth would we only get one response? That sounds to me extremely strange in the current circumstances. Um, so against that background that you've only got one response, which doesn't allow you to establish value for money, you've no comparative to, uh, to, to take. Um, and also the fact the issues raised by the ward councillors with regard to lack of consultation. Could I suggest that the Cabinet considers deferring this contract award this evening and on the, fa on the basis that there are actually two playgrounds involved in this report, that it goes out for a retender based on both playgrounds and that tenderers also be asked to provide a price as well as for each individual playground what their best price would be were they to be awarded the contract for both playgrounds. That would allow you to demonstrate a commitment to establishing value for money. Thank you. Uh, you're going to have to excuse me, Councillor Ogle, be here if I read um, from uh, an email about the awarding of the contract. Uh, it's it's not one of my my skills, um, but if I can read to you what what it says, as a design and build project, the playground refurbishment is classed as a services contract, and therefore the budget exceeds the threshold of one hundred ninety nine, one hundred eighty nine thousand pounds three hundred thirty 
pounds, above which contracts have to be advertised in the EU. As a result, an authorised framework, ESPO Framework 115 Lot 2, dash large external play facilities was used as this includes a pre-qualified list of nine suppliers who can be invited to submit bids in a further competition exercise. As per S5.6 of, of the Council's contract procedure rules, the evaluation criteria was approved through a delegated decision by the Director and Cabinet Member, which was published on the 1st of July 2020. A copy of the evaluation criteria is attached for information. I've got that as well. It is disappointing only one bid was submitted. Previously, we have had far more interest. We have recently heard that Bradford have a 600,000 case scheme that the suppliers were all busy trying to win, which may explain the lack of interest at this time. So we did try our, our best, but there was actually one, only one one group interested. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to add to uh, what Councillor Jones has said there. The, the issue is best value has been raised again. Best value is demonstrated by a compliant procurement process. There has been a compliant procurement process here. Um, the criteria were fixed uh, in accordance with the Constitution. And whilst I understand uh, Councillor Ogilvie's um, suggestion, that the time for making that suggestion was perhaps um, several months ago when the uh, initial decision was taken as to the uh, procurement methodology to be used. Um, I think the point was made earlier uh, by Councillor Tomlinson, the decision tonight is whether to award the contract or not, um, based on uh, the information that's before you. Councillor Martin. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Chair. Um, I'm going to go back to the, the conversation that uh, revolved around the uh, neighbourhood uh, hubs. Um, um, so, are, are we, I guess, because this is the concept of reassurance, is that, are we still putting projects through the hubs, for instance, playgrounds and things like that? Do they still have to come through the hubs? And uh, uh, with regard to the Penwitham um, uh, home, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Scrange Park, uh, as it's all that their mother's back on the park. Um, I think it, I feel it's something all councillors should be involved in having a look at as well. So um, it's just my thoughts, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. We've taken on board I mean, what has been said in terms of consultation and uh, and everything else. Uh, Councillor Bretherton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Campbell and myself would like to um, uh, thank uh, Councillor Lomax for his continued support in the Bellisware project. I'd noticed on page 110.18 it says details of the playground consultations will be sent to the chairs. Uh, the chair is Councillor Lomax and I'm just wondering if we could, Councillor Campbell and myself could uh, see the results of the recent consultation on the Bellisware playground. Thank you. I think I've already said that, that um, in, in the future we will be, as I have done with you, I have engaged with you and would continue to do so and we will continue to engage with ward members as well as the chair of the community hub. Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay, thanks for that. Um, Councillor Colin Charples. Thank you, Chair. Just a, a quick point. Uh, thinking about wider consultation when we're thinking of building more of these playgrounds, are we actually looking at some of the issues that have already arisen at some of the existing playgrounds and maybe take that forward so we don't have the same problems going on? For example, at Seven Stars, which is fairly close to me, there's one particular piece of equipment that has caused some fairly serious injuries already on, on several occasions. In fact, that piece of equipment is currently... Uh, been taken down, temporarily taken down, but we need to learn from those. I think that particular piece of equipment is dangerous if not, if it's not, uh, if people aren't there to see it being used properly. I just wondered, uh, in the consultation process across Borough, are we considering, uh, you know, the, the things that have gone wrong elsewhere? Well, I think that that's something that has to be taken into account in everything that we do. I mean, the health and safety. So, I mean, I think we're getting a little bit off the point. I mean, I think 
we've uh, we've answered the, the all the, all the questions in relation to this. So I'm going to uh, move to the vote. Is that Council Clark? Sorry to prolong it, uh, Chairman. It was just uh, uh, the comments that were made by Councillor Tomlinson on project planning and delivery. I'm a bit concerned with his explanation. I don't think it's in accordance with our normal procedures, and I'm sure that uh, the Director of Governance was, was listening to that because a member of the Governance Committee. I'm a bit concerned on the way uh, he suggested we pursue projects. It's not, not, not proper pro, uh, project planning, and I just wanted to know from uh, the Director of Governance that he was happy with that statement. No, I'm going. Okay, I mean, I hear what we're you're a, saying. We're in a, we're, we're in a public meeting, Chairman. Well, yeah, Chris. Uh, yes, yes, I am. Okay, I'm going to move. To, I'm going to move to the uh, to the to the vote on this now. Um, um, we've had a proposal and second. Our cabinet all agreed. Thank you. That is carried. Uh, Okay, um, well, we'll move on to uh, item 13, uh, volun uh, volunteering uh, policy and framework, which will be introduced by Councillor Belinsky Gelder. Thank you, Chair. Um, this um, original report to Council on the 6th of February 2019 with a decision to undertake a consultation with stakeholders on a volunteer strategy and to provide a further report relating to provision of an expenses scheme. Since then, the environment has evolved and the new corporate plan implemented September 2019. Therefore, as an update, I um, just want to give a brief update. The strategy side of volunteering is led by the South Ribble Partnership, who have a volunteer and communities group which incorporates findings of consultation carried out by the partnership. Employer-led volunteering was directly come out of the community strategy in response to the need for supporting the wider third sector volunteering community. So there is a lack of a CVS, which is a council for voluntary services in South Ribble. I think one existed some time ago, some years ago, but it doesn't exist anymore. So this is the council positioning itself um, to fulfil part of the role, I suppose, of a council for voluntary services. The report, this report provides a policy that enables the council to actively take forward volunteering through its own services, both for residents and employees, and, and it includes an expenses scheme, um, which is presented to Cabinet. There's two parts to the policy. The first one is volunteering for the council. So this is where members of the public um, volunteer for the council. Volunteering with the council is, a social val is about social value and action, which includes supporting and developing local people to build skills and confidence. The policy builds on a strong foundation of existing 190 volunteers, establishes a consistent approach to recruitment, support and development, will develop new volunteering opportunities, services will be encouraged each year through their business planning process to identify opportunities for volunteers, considers how volunteers can be developed through training and support, and provides expenses to support those which may be financially excluded from volunteering. Um, the policy integrates the role of a time credits, um, developing opportunities for individuals to earn time credits when volunteering with the council. The time credit provides recognition of the value the council places on someone's time when volunteering with us, which simultaneously enabling individuals to redeem them against a number of activities for themselves, families and friends. The second element to the policy is an employee volunteering. As people volunteer with the council, so employees can volunteer to support communities and good causes. So it gives um, employees of the council three days paid leave a year to volunteer within their own communities. Emerging anecdotal evidence from the impact of COVID-19 indicates a change in the volunteer demographic, shifting to working age. 
the employee volunteer framework is one being considered by wider partners to provide a cross borough pool of volunteer and opportunities to, to directly strengthen and support communities. And I think I need to take this opportunity to congratulate the people of South Ribble for their altruism throughout the crisis um, and to thank them for the support and the offers of help that we've received. I mean, it hasn't gone unnoticed. So the policies, three days paid leave per year, this was a standard government initially set out as part of a civil society policy linked to personal development plan to support learning and progression for employees. It's a flexible framework to allow short term intensive volunteering on a project or a long term volunteer on, on areas such as trusteeships. I personally have my own reservations around volunteering. I feel that if leaders nationally want to set an example and volunteer, that would be a fantastic opportunity to show their contribution to the civil society or big society. But while the leader of the country is struggling to pay his own bills and maintain the life that he's accustomed to, while asking local residents to do more for free, while many are still not being paid the, um, the um, living wage, I struggle to ask people to do more work for free. This policy, however, is written and designed to enable those which wish to volunteer and those which want to in, um, improve their skills and experience and also offer their services, but it will not be abused to fill in the gaps created by austerity where paid members of staff should be remunerated for the work they do. So I'll read out the two, the two policies to provide and implement the policy for volunteering with the council and the second element to approve and implement the policy for employee volunteering. Thank you. Any questions from cabinet members? Any, any, any questions from Council Walton? Thank you, Chair. Um, I support the policy for the volunteering within the community. Um, in my opinion, the paperwork included in the policy of volunteering seems a little bit long and complicated. And would um, the council be supporting an officer to carry out the administration of the volunteers? Uh, another concern is over the temporal time credits and how effective their implementation would be, implementation would be to the residents of South Rival. I've previously asked for a breakdown of costs and would, uh, that would be incurred by the council to implement this scheme, but I haven't received any details yet. I understand that Chorley Borough Council use the temporal time credit, so perhaps we could ask for details of costs if all age groups of the borough benefit from the, the um, uh, Chorley uh, benefit from the scheme of time credits. I'd also like to request perhaps a member's learning hour. Uh, concerning this issue, which perhaps uh, a member from Chorley Borough Council could speak on the ongoing costs and benefits from such a scheme to all the residents of Chorley Borough Council and then the expected costs and benefits to all the residents of South River Borough Council. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the so the time credits will be administered and partly funded through the South Ribble partnership. I think if you want to know the details around the ins and outs of the... Is there somebody un unmuted? If you could mute, we're getting some feedback here. Thanks. Um, so the tempo um, time credits element of this um, is partly funded by the South Ribble Partnership and I think the leader's just indicated who's over that, that he's happy to speak on that. But I also think the officer would be happy to go into more detail on that. And the first part of your question was about something being overcomplicated. Was that, could you just repeat that bit for me please? Yeah, I just, in, my opinion, the, in my opinion, the form seemed a little bit complicated and might put people off wanting to volunteer in the first place if they are asked to complete complicated forms. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think they can apply online as well and I'm not sure if the form is as complicated online. So I think I think through tempo. So I will pass you on to the leader. Thanks. Thanks, uh, 
and yeah, the, yeah the, the Karen, the, the the tempo time credits are managed wholly through the South River Partnership, and the budgets that are allocated for the time credits, are, well, they were in the budget this year's budget, and it's also within the paperwork for the um, for the partnership, and the partnership is monitoring um, progress as well and performance of those time credits. But we'll get, I'll, I'll get, um, I'll ask Howard Anthony through the offices to to send you the paperwork that we, we've got the partnership and it does explain it in more detail. Councillor Ogilvy. Thank you, Chair. It's just a quick one. It's to do with the list of risks being managed in the in this report. Um, the one bit that I can't see relates to insurance cover. I wonder if you could just uh, reassure me what arrangement is in place for insurance for volunteers who may be working uh, with the council and equally when council employees go to some other organisation how are they covered in the event of any accidental damage injury to them to themselves thank you thank you um i think health and safety is top of our list um, just before i pass you on to jennifer i would like to let I'd just, just like to mention a typo on point 21. It says South Rubble, which I always get when, I, when it automatically does a, a change. But I'll just pass you on to Jennifer. Thanks for that insurance question. Hi, the insurance team have been engaged in the process all along the way. So they've been reviewing both policies and procedures and have been in contact with our insurance firm to make sure that they understand what we're putting in place and that the insurance will cover our volunteers and our staff um, if we if they do volunteer within works hours. Okay, thanks for that. Councillor Caleb Tomlinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to con congratulate uh, Councillor Daniela Gelder Belinsky. Fantastic report. I don't need a learning hour. And I think it, I think we should all raise our hands and say it's a great report. Thank you. Thank you. No. No. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, shall we move to the votes? Um, all those in favour? Thank you. That is uh, carried. Um, right. Okay. If we can now move on to. Uh, Item 14, Parks and Capital Projects. Councillor Sue Jones. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the purpose of this report is to bring capital improvement projects for the Let Ice House and New Arboretum at Worden Park and drainage replacement at Hurst Grange Park, Penwitham, before members and to seek permission to spend the all allocated capital budgets. It's also to advise members happily of an offer of funding from the, th the trustees of Worden Estate to contribute to the cost of a new door for the Ice House. Uh, the costs, just, just briefly, are £10,000 for work to the Ice House, £30,000 for completion of the new arboretum, £25,000 for replacement of the drainage culvert. Uh, the details of the background to, to these three proposals are given in points six, seven and eight of the report. But basically, the, the ice house has suffered damage over the years and this will, will ensure that not only do we stop the deterioration and preserve the stonework, uh, and with a kind offer of, from the trustees, it's proposed to replace the door with a similar timber construction. Hopefully this will include a barred window to allow visitors to see inside so that they actually don't have to vandalise the place to, to, to try to get in there. The final phase of the new arboretum looks to extend the central vista further southwest to the boundary of the park. It will require the removal of some existing trees. However, the, those were mitigated in 2018-19 by the planting of 100 new trees. And finally, the replacement of the drainage culvert in Hurst Grange Park. This is pro a proposal to replace the failed secondary culvert with a modern plastic pipe. The main culvert was replaced in 2006 and the number of, of failings of the second, secondary has caused issues, particularly when events are on and problems with drainage. 
um, and those are the um, the recommendations. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Um, is that seconded? Yeah. Any comments from cabinet members? Right. Okay. Uh, any comments or any questions from uh, councillors not on cabinet? Yeah. Councillor Thank you, Chair. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Right. Okay. Is it not fixed? It, yeah, I'm not getting an echo anymore. Um, yes, just very quickly to say, as one of the ward members for uh, that includes Warden Park, um, I very much welcome the uh, improvements to the Arboretum and the Ice House. Thank you. Good stuff. Yeah. Anybody else? No. Nope. Okay. Can we take the vote? All those in favour? Yeah, lovely, thank you. Uh, moving on to item 15, uh, extension of public space protection orders. Councillor Sue Jones. Thank you, Chair. Hopefully this is, this is going to be uh, quite quick. Um, in November 2017, the Council adopted a series of PSPOs relating to the control of dogs uh, these replaced those orders from 2009. We have a legal requirement as a council for the orders to be replaced every th three years. Um, if I can just emphasize, we are not proposing any amendments. It's just the legal requirement to renew for a further three years. If you look on page 161, you have the list of the play areas uh, which we're, which we're looking at. Um, if I can just say to, to some members who might have some, some concerns, because of the short time scale, we will only renew the current locations, but we will then be looking at uh, another additional three sites, including Bank Top, Seven Stars and Leedale in the new year. If we had tried to add the new, the new sites, it would have prolonged the process and we would have missed the deadline for renewal of November the 3rd. So no change, it's just, it's just uh, renewing. Okay, thanks for that. We all, any questions from cabinet members? Questions for, no, okay, good, we agree that. Thank you. Right, okay. Well, before uh, we're now, now that the uh, leader has joined us, we'll go back to um, item number uh, five for the leader to, in to introduce it. Thanks, Mick, and uh, apologies for um, my late arrival with the Chief Executive. Well, I'll, I'll debrief uh, the Cabinet shortly when we get to the next agenda item. Um, happy to present the um, the paper chair has presented, there's been one decision, um, urgent decision on the 28th of, December of September, that was the test and trace support payment of £500. Um, should be near uh, £5,000 perhaps when people have been asked to isolate for such a significant period. However, it's a government policy um, that we are required as a local authority to, to implement. And I think Jen and the team had been given the details on the Friday and implementation had to be by the Monday. So it was an extremely urgent decision and I'm happy to take any questions from members of the cabinet or others. Thank you. Are there any, are there any questions on that? No. Any questions? No. Okay. Can we, well, we, we'll accept that. Um, well, we're, we're noting that, yeah. Um, Okay, uh, can we move on to uh, item six, uh, the prevention zone framework? Um, thanks, Chair. This is um, this is obviously uh, a standard agenda, standing sorry agenda item on cabinet meetings now in respect to um, the, the COVID pandemic, and Jen and the team put these detailed reports together for us. But what we do have, as I'm sure everyone will imagine, is an extremely fast moving. Um, pandemic at the moment and since this update was provided by Jen and the team we've obviously had a major change to government legislation and strategy in respect to the control of the um, of the pandemic. Um, just so 
members are all aware, I've just returned because it is relevant um, from a call with um, with Jenny Harris, the Deputy Public Health Officer, and the Health Minister at Arga, and all the Lancashire leaders. Um, there's a there's a push, a real push for from government for Lancashire leaders to request to go into Tier Three, um, and we're still struggling as Lancashire leaders to understand why. The government are pushing us to make that decision because as far as we're concerned particularly how and i know a number of my colleagues in lancashire agree with this if the government if the government advisors and the government ministers believe that lancashire should be in tier three then why are they wasting their time trying to negotiate a position why don't they just place us into tier three now my real frustration with this now is it appears to be a trade-off where they're trying, the government is saying to us, if you put yourself into tree, uh, tier three, we might give you some more money to support your um, economy and your local businesses. And I'm not having that. This is managed by the demand. If it is a public health um, demand that we go into tier three, then the government has a responsibility to do that. And I keep saying that to the government. Um, nothing was achieved on tonight's call. Um, we were presented with the same medical information that we were presented with on Saturday, that we were presented with on Friday, that we were presented with on Thursday, and that you've all read yourselves in the media. The pandemic is now out of control. Um, I think we all recognise that. And I, as far as I'm concerned, the government has a duty to protect its citizens, but also where it possibly can to protect the, uh, the economy and the local businesses as well. So as you can sense possibly, uh, there's a bit of frustration here. Um, we need to do the right thing by our population because people are dying. And I will be repeating that statement when we meet again tomorrow morning. Um, since this report was produced as well by Jen and the team, clearly a lot of the information within these reports has been superseded anyway. Um, and other than that, and other than Chair, if Jen has anything to add, um, they we're happy to take any questions that members may have. Uh, really just uh, just a few things to add um the team have been working very hard at the moment on um bringing test and trace to be part of um the south Ribble borough council so from um tomorrow if the national trust and trace system can't trace somebody within 24 hours that information then will be passed to us at the council to trace those individuals to make sure their information is in the trust and trace system so we've been working hard over the last month to get that system set up. So that system set up, we've got the staff to do that. Um, and we've got all the uh, risk assessments and the procedures in place to make sure that we track all those people that the national test and track system can't trace. Um, in addition, we've also been um, setting up the support payment that was discussed in the urgent decision. So there's two different payments. There's a discretionary one, which is still to be agreed and the um, government um, scheme of the £500. So that's been set up um, and is ready to go and the applications are open. Um, and we've also been working with our businesses to ensure that they understand the legislation because obviously the legislation has changed about seven or eight times, particularly in one particular day, it changed about six times. So we've been working with our businesses to understand and we've also been undertaking enforcement activities of an evening, of a weekend, to make sure that they're following the um, legislation as well. Thanks. Well, thanks for that. I mean, uh, my uh, admi uh, admiration and I suppose sympathy goes to, uh, to our staff who are having to uh, manage this uh, situation which at times seems to be uh, really sort of out of control but I mean I am pleased to record that I do think that the, the staff here in South Ribble um, are doing their absolute uh, utmost uh, to make sure uh, that one that we contain uh, the, uh, the, the, the pandemic as much as possible and two that we de deliver uh, to uh, our residents the support that they are desperate to receive. Um, is there anybody in the cabinet who wants to raise any questions on that? Is there anybody uh, not on the cabinet to, to raise that? Councillor Howarth? Um, I don't know if it's appropriate to actually ask questions as to perhaps what has been said in your meeting tonight, but 
it was suggested in a briefing I had yesterday that there may even be a two tier, three tier system in that parts of Lancashire could be moved into tier three while we stay in tier two because our infection rates are much lower. And I don't know if there's any suggestion as to that has been made. Yeah, yeah, this is the, it's a perfectly reasonable question, Councillor Howarth, isn't it? The, the, the challenge that we have is that, 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 firstly, that is a possibility. Yes, that is a possibility. I think it's widely recognised that East Lancashire is in a predicament at the moment, a serious predicament at the moment. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that, you know, everything that possibly the government could do to support the community in East Lancashire, they should be doing now. They shouldn't be waiting. Um, and there's also a possibility that the government may make a decision tonight, tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, um, and move, they may move some parts of Lancashire in the, whenever they see fit. But also, as you'll notice in the media, and it is true, the tier three regulations, as they're stated, can change because the government are wanting local authorities to agree additional measures in their, in their ge geographical area. And this is where the, the real frustration is, and you'll have had that from the Metro Mayor, uh, Mayor Rotherham, Steve Rotherham in, in Liverpool, where you know that they're asking the, the government to say, and we'll give you additional resource if you if you ask us to close down um, more of your businesses. And it just doesn't it doesn't add up to me. It's it's nonsensical. But the answer to your question is that the the the, the uh, anything could happen, David. At any time, we just don't know. We're not in control of it. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chair. Obviously, it's uh, something that we're all, um, I was going to say, concerned about. It's more, a bit more than concerned. We're seriously worried about it, obviously. Um, you, you mentioned about request for going to Tier 3, and you might not know the answer to this, but it, my understanding is that Liverpool asked to go into Tier 3. Is, is that... No, have, so, I, have I got that right or wrong? No, that, that's incorrect, Phil. Sorry, Councillor Smith. Um, this is where we've got to be careful with the communications. Liverpool City Region was told by the government that it was going into Tier 3 and they, their best opportunity to bring in more resource into the City Region was to agree to that with some additional measures. So they, it's like, for example, um, Lancashire has been told what the red lines are in respect to Lancashire moving into Tier 3 and what are non-negotiable issues for Tier 3. So no, the answer is categorically Liverpool was told last week it was definitely going into Tier 3. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to sort this, you know, de debate, you know, the Liverpool region and all that. Okay, go on, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, I accept what you say. I just get a different story on TV, I think, but there we are. And, and it's just with regard to the, the report itself. Whilst, you know, I've looked and, and, and read a lot of it, um, the, the Resilience Forum report, uh, we seem to have two of, which look to me exactly the same. Now, I don't know whether they are the same or not. They've got the same heading, they've got the same date. Um, and pages 41 to 62 look like the same as 63 to 84. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I've started to read them and they look word for word. They look the same, but they might not be. All I'm saying is if there are any more like that, it, something highlighted would be quite useful to, in coloured end if, if, if there's some changes. Okay. Taking on. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Sounds like Caleb Tomlinson. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I just ask Jenny Mullin, um, the track and trace, is it done by the NHS or is it outsourced by somebody else? Thank you. Okay, leader will answer yeah. that. Uh, it's not fair to ask an officer to answer that question there, Caleb. It's, um, the, the track and trace is um, through the NHS, but it's fully privatised. Mm. Uh, I apologise. It's funded through public health, isn't it? Yeah. Councillor Derek Forrester. 
thank you, leader. Uh, I'm concerned to hear that the, as you say, privatized uh, national track and trace is allowed 24 hours to try and uh, make these contacts. I mean, their crass inability to track to, uh, to to reach contacts is well known. Whereas, of course. Um, when we get our local uh, people to find them, the percentage people tracked down and, and traced is, is very high. Um, I suppose m most of us watched that Salisbury documentary with the poisoning in Salisbury and saw the efficiency of the local public health uh, people in Salisbury. It was a demonstration of what could have been done in this uh, wretched COVID epidemic. Um, has, has uh, Jenny got any idea how long they, the, the actual contacts will have been out loose in the borough before um, we could get our efficient track and trace working on them and, and, uh, and stopping them spreading the virus? Uh, well, I think that's how long is a piece of string, really. I mean, uh, I don't know where... Uh, well, we, could, we, could, we, we just can't answer that. I mean, all we can say is, is that whatever we're charged to do, we will try and do it, uh, you know, as efficiently as, as, as possible. As you... Well, just as an update, Chair, the, the, just so we're absolutely clear on this, the, the national track and the 12 billion national track and, na national track and trace system isn't being devolved down to local governments. We're having to put some of our own resource into it what they've agreed to do on the track and trace to try and make it more local is um, Serco and the other private providers have been asked to create hubs um, down wherever they're based. So they would say that there could be there could be a hub based in London uh, that speaks directly to Liverpool, for example, or a hub down in Somerset that speaks directly to Blackburn. One of the challenges, real challenges we've had, is we've asked the government to devolve this to local authorities but we desperately need the resource so that we can give Jen and the team you know 30 sets of boots on the ground so to speak and access to the data and I don't know if you've picked up in the report but we only started getting access to the track and trace data yesterday Jen yeah yeah it was yesterday yeah and we can download it yesterday some six or eight months after the start of the pandemic so you can sense our frustration here um but the what we're not doing the Jen and the team we might not be being funded by central government for this but Jen and the team do everything they possibly can when there are any outbreaks in South Ribble so just to do the check the tracking and tracing themselves anyway. Yeah thanks for that. Councillor Colin Clark. Thanks Chairman. Uh, the report identifies the five new posts being funded by uh, Lancashire County Council until uh, 31st of March 2022. I wonder if the leader could clarify the terms of the employment. Are they on um, temporary contracts until the, 20, uh, the end of that funding uh, arrangement? Thank you. Thank you. I can't tell you at this moment, but I'll ask Jen to write to you with the details, Colin. Thank you. Councillor Caleb Tomlinson. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, I, I would just like to apologise to Jen for asking a question that I shouldn't have done. Thank you. OK, thanks for that. OK, um, well, there we are. Uh, well, thanks for that report and update. Um, I'm sure that, you know, things are going to unravel probably later today, tomorrow and afterwards. I mean, it seems to be changing by the minute. So, um, can we just uh, ex accept that report, Governor? Yeah. Have we got a second for it? Anyway. Okay. Um, item uh, seven: options for the council rebound, rebrand. Re re Leader. Thanks, Mick. You got your uh, Mick. Um, so something slightly, um, yes, not serious here, the, the, the rebound and all um, councillors will be aware, members of the cabinet will be aware that the within the budget there were proposals for, for, for rebranding the 
the authority um, and there's a report in front of you and I'll just, just let me just read out if I may chair just a couple of bits of the background to why we're looking to do this. It says that under paragraph nine the council's brand and logo has been in place for a number of years and was originally created in partnership with Brunsaw College and in order to maintain a professional and modern identity it is important that the logo and brand is regularly reviewed particularly given the challenging sorry the changing nature of how it is used and the needs to be flexible on uh, our digital platforms um, the vision for the council now is for a healthy and happy community flourishing together in a safe and fairer borough that's led by a council recognized for being innovative financially sustainable and accountable we want our brand to reflect this and the refresh will help the council move on from the legacy issues it has suffered over recent years and be seen to be forward thinking and a modern authority um, the comments there that one of the great benefits that we've got from our shared services now is that Andrew and the team that now work um, as, for us as much as they do with Chorley have added a huge amount of value here and we've had the digital or the digital designs were all done in house and I really do thank them for that. You'll notice within the um, recommendations that are presented um, we were asked to agree the logo options for consultation set, set out in Appendix A and I'll come on to them in a second and then to bring back um, any feedback that we get um, and any slight amendments that may be made to the logos back to the next meeting of the Cabinet for final approval. Um, we're aiming for the November meeting of the Cabinet to um, approve the new logo. Um, and before I take any questions, Chair, I, I think Andrew's on the call. Andrew? Agreed. Yeah. Hi, Andrew. Is there anything more you'd like to add into the process? And perhaps you could just describe the, the shortlisted logos that we're presenting tonight. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, Chair. Um, yeah, as you can imagine with this, we've gone through a, a long list of ideas, uh, starting from scribbles on a piece of paper right through to designing the, the styles up. Um, what we've tried to do with it really is reflect um, elements that are relevant to the borough. Um, so you can see running right through all uh, three of the options we're putting forward really that um, we try to incorporate sort of our commitment to the green agenda, um, which is really important going forward. Um, we've tried to include um, things that are relevant to the borough. So we've got the greenery and parks in there, which, which we know are really important to people. Obviously the river um, is in there to represent the River Ribble, um, which is in our name. And we've also put together a couple of the options are a, a more of a modern twist on the South Ribble Crest as well, as I think people um, often see local authorities as quite an authoritative organisation and the crest and the tradition of it is associated with that. So we wanted to include an option um, which had that in it as well. Um, in terms of the, the sort of consultation, what we're looking to do, um, we're going to be asking people about the three options and sort of what elements people like in them really. Um, it may be that the final version isn't quite exactly as, as any of these three options are, but it could be people like like the element of the river, they like the element of the greenery, and um, we might get some other suggestions that can help us uh, amend and adapt the options with it. And I think one of the key points for us, uh, and, and this is part of what came out of the resident survey, you know, you can choose a logo and I can guarantee it'll probably split a room. Some people will like it, some people won't like it, um, but it's how it's used going forward as part of the wider brand. And I think that's what we can um, with the expertise we've got in-house now with Assured Services, we can make sure it's used professionally across everything we do. So all the things that we do in, in South Ribble are, are linked across, they look nice and fresh, and when people are out and about in the borough, they can see what, what we're doing, uh, what the council's doing for them in their local community. Um, so that that's sort of what's, what's really important as part of it. Um, as as uh, Councillor Foster mentioned, um, the, this is done, going to be done with an existing budget. So I think the key thing here is, in the main, this will be done on replacement only. There will be some things that are out there in the borough. You, you know, every resident's got a, a house or wheelie bin. We're certainly not looking at, um, you know, getting rid of all those and swapping them. They'll be done on a replacement only basis. So when we've used up the stock, existing stock with the with the current logo and brand on, then we would look to order new ones with, with any new uh, logo that we introduce. Um, so I think that covers it from, from me. Um, if that's okay, Chair, um, happy to help with any questions if needed. Uh, thanks for that. Thanks for the reader um, for the introduction. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I second it. I think it's uh, it's appropriate that we do uh, bring forward and have a look at the rebranding. 
Uh, I, I, I like the designs. I mean, I think it does establish us as a, uh, as, as, uh, as a borough. Um, I think it is important because when you do go out and about, sometimes people say, well, where are you? In South Ribble. Um, I think that, that the, the, the logos there do uh, describe particularly the ones with, uh, with, the, with the rose on where we're in Lancashire. So it's got the river in there. So yeah, happy to set a second that. Uh, any other comments from uh, the uh, cameras? No. Any comments from anybody else not on on cameras? Councilor Michael Green. Councilor Michael Green. Thank you, uh, Councilor Tevington. Um, if we if we look at the comments on the residents survey, which which are set out on page six of the report um, and those comments if i can summarize them set out that the logo has no impact upon the re respondents on whether the council is modern on whether the council is professional and on whether the council is trustworthy on that basis councillor i would urge the cabin not to proceed uh, with the rebranding however if cabinet is minded to proceed can, can i ask some questions please Firstly, what would be the cost of changing signage at the Civic Centre on uniforms and on vehicles? And secondly, as I said, um, on the basis of the resident survey, there's no demonstration of demand from the South Hibble community for the logo to be changed. But if Cabinet is minded to proceed, would you incorporate two additional options for consultation in addition to the three which are set out with the report? The two additional ones being the current logo of South Hibble Borough Council and the other one being the current crest of South Hibble Borough Council uh, because, because then we might genuinely be able to assess what the preference of South Hibble residents, businesses etc is as to whether they prefer to stick with one of the current options or whether they prefer to move to one of the new ones which are being put forward and I think that might help to, us to actually sift out what the public mood is regarding this, because obviously the resident survey was not conclusive at all from what is set out in the report. Thank you very much. Okay, Leader. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, paragraph 24, the majority of respondents neither agreed nor disagreed when asked if the logo gives the impression that the council is trustworthy. However, the more respondents agreed than disagreed with this statement. The above feedback suggests that the current logo does not have the impact of portraying the council as a modern forward-thinking organisation and is one of the reasons for a refresh. Every, every modern organisation refreshes its, um, its, its corporate image, is that, if that's the correct word, it, it, its logo um, as it, as it, and its identity as it moves forward. South Ribble hasn't done that for a number of years and the cabinet are taking this forward as we've um, taken forward a new corporate strategy, the new corporate priorities, everything's presented in a different way and South Ribble needs to move forward in my view. In answer to the direct questions, will we open out the, um, the consultation to include the existing um, logo and the crest, the answer is no. Um, as part of the process that we've been through diligently over the last um, few weeks with officers, with the design team and the deputy leader and myself, the, we've looked at those as options and decided they're not options that we wish to take forward. And the final question I think was regarding cost. Well, I think that's already been answered. There's um, the budget's already been established in this year's um, budget. Um, it's a minor soft touch to start with. Um, when we and then it will be done on an ad hoc replacement basis. So when a when a, a um, when a truck is replaced, the logo will be replaced. When a bin is replaced, the logo will be and colours will be replaced on the the bin. Um, so it is very minor, soft touch to start with. Yeah, I mean, Councillor Green asked, canvassed the Cabinet about their opinions. Um, and I think that we set out originally a budget, which was, you know, between two amounts. Um, and I think, like Andrew has said, we've managed to minimise the cost 
because it's come in house because of shared services. Um, for me, this will actually create a sense of place. I'd love to see one of these on the back of people who are collecting and emptying our bins. I'd love to see it on litter bins and things like that. Any of those three. Um, and I'm happy f to go out to consultation and ask other people what they think about it. Thanks for that. Uh, Chief Executive wants to come in. Thank you, uh, Chair. Just a reminder as well, uh, Chair, I don't think Andrew got actually picked this up, but we are about to relaunch the website. Uh, in the coming months and um, this will be a key piece of the look and feel of the website uh, and as people can see from some of the performance reports people do transact quite significantly with the council through the website so it's important that, that is fresh and modern uh, and this is one way of achieving that so um, that would be my view about going out to consultation uh, on the rebrand thank you cheers thanks for that Councillor michael green Thanks, Chairman. Can, can I can I seek clarification, please? Because because the report is clear over where the twenty thousand pounds is coming from. So it's been it's been stated by the cabinet this evening that this is coming from the budget. But the report sets out at two different places: one that it's coming from the place promotion budget, and that's another place that it's coming from reserves. So could we have clarification, please, where the funding is actually coming from? Uh. I'll get the officers to write to you. It's from his existing budgets, but I don't think James is on the call tonight. Um, it was in the budget because we set the budget, so we'll get him to write to you, Councillor Green. Yeah, okay. Councillor Howarth. Councillor Howarth. Um, yeah, I think I made my views clear as to whether we should be doing this when it came to the Cabinet, but given that you are going to do it, um, I do think that the current logo is pretty horrible and dated, but you mentioned that you'd um, had lots of discussions. Are these the only three designs that came forward or were there any others? And how did we arrive at the final three? Uh, I'm trying to be polite here because I know the person who designed them is, is on that screen up there. <laughs> but, uh, but a couple of them look like the sort of designs one of my lads would have done for his football shirt for the under 15s um, rather than a, a local authority. So I wonder if there are any other designs that perhaps could be taken into consideration. Well, no, I mean, what's, what, what's in the paper will be the uh, three designs that will be going out for consultation. Sorry, you're disappointed in that. Sure, I think there were about 30 options when we started, something like that. No, oh, okay. Uh, well, can we move on that? Can we ask Cabinet to adopt it? Just now. Councillor Mary Green, you're muted. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I just feel that at the moment, the situation we're in, especially very much at the moment, where people are literally dying by the hundreds, we've got this massive problem in South Ribble. And I do feel it's a little bit of, of a bad time and could cause some bad feeling in the residents of South Ribble that we're looking very much at a flip, flippant thing that's not essential when people are being impacted so greatly in this borough with people dying and not having contact with families, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I do feel this is a, is a topic that should perhaps be shelled at the moment until perhaps the climate improves. Because I don't think as residents are going to be very pleased with us looking at what they might class as a as a as a silly issue when they've got more serious issues at home in the homes. Thank you. Well, I think, Councillor, I mean, the one thing that I would say is, is that I don't think you can accuse this administration or this council of not taking the pandemic as seriously as possible. We know, I mean, the leader has outlined what is happening and what's happening in the borough and what's happening nationwide. And we're doing everything we can uh, to contain it within our borough. We've already congratulated 
the uh, the officers for the work that they're doing. So, I mean, when we're talking about this item on the agenda, it's got nothing to do and it'll take nothing away from what we're doing to fight this uh, horrible pandemic. I mean, and uh, you know, if you're talking about life, life goes on. I mean, and I'm now going to move to the vote anyway. Okay, uh, all those in favour? Thank you. Cheers. Okay. Leader with the corporate performance fa uh, framework review. Bear with me, I'm naked for the first time tonight without my notes, so I've got to move back to, there we go, I've got it there. Right, thank you. Um, I'm glad you're chairing the meeting tonight, Councillor Titherington, because it saved my response to that last question. Um, corporate performance framework review. As all experienced councillors know, um, business as usual, we have to keep on delivering the vital services of this council. One of the areas that you'll remember, members, from the uh, one of the challenges that we have, and, this, and, I, and I, you know, from the, some of the historic stuff, and I, I don't give you my word, we're looking forward now, but the um, the quality of data and the corporate performance benchmarking we were undertaking wasn't as it should be, and there was some quite serious concerns that the the administration at the time, the information they were being provided with, wasn't necessarily accurate. And therefore, what we have done with um, with Vicky and the shared services team, we have brought forward um, a new, a brand new corporate performance framework. Um, this um, basically, this is to ensure that we have up to date and robust uh, approach to performance management that can be consistently and effectively responds to the needs of each authority across both shared services. So that's the first point to note that we are sharing this policy framework with Charlie. Effective performance management, management sorry, is vital for improving our outcomes for our community as it provides a key mechanism for continuous service improvement and excellence. And we don't, we all agree, we have to have some confidence in the information that we're being presented with as well. So then briefly, the, the overview of the revised policy is set out on page 86 of the agenda pack, but basically it's the planning process and how strategies and priorities are developed. Moving on to the measures, uh, the measuring mechanisms used to capture the progress that we're making, how this is then reviewed and importantly scrutinised, um, how the plans and strategies are revised moving forward to ensure they accurately respond to the, the needs of our residents and the roles and responsibilities of staff and communities within the process itself. If you then move forward, Chair, the, from page 89 and onwards, we have the new corporate performance framework. The first thing I'll say, and hopefully members of the Cabinet will agree, once again, it's presented in a very user-friendly way, and I thank Vicky and the team for that. It clearly sets out the purpose of the framework. It sets out now the planning process, but with those critical dates included that we must meet, um, the measures that we're going to adopt, the how we how we manage the performance data and report upon it, and then finally the at the back there on page 95 the corporate reporting schedule with the different quarters of the year and again this is something that's critically important because if you miss any of those steps then you could your your data your quality of your data could be challenged so i'm more than happy um chair to uh, commend this report to council for adoption and i'm happy to take any questions you may have on souls wiki it, it's to Gabner tonight, but uh, yeah, I second that. Uh, any other comments from cabinet members? No? Any comments from anybody else? Councillor Mary Green. Councillor Mary Green. Thank you, Chairman. It's not actually on this issue that I want to speak, but I do want to come in and interrupt Councillor Foster. I don't appreciate the bullying attitude he spoke of my question or comment before and saying that he would have dealt with that in a different way it's okay. implying that i'm i'm talking okay about okay no, so no just a moment just no a moment chair no 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 i no, would no, no way in any no, way no, uh, criticize no. councillor 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 no way no way would i ever criticize a member Councilor. of staff Councilor. and imply that i was doing that Councilor. incorrect and that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. I'll tell you what I don't like as a chair is that when councillors, elected members, 
disrespect the chair. And I think that on that occasion, you disrespect the chair. And in future, if anybody carries on like that, any councillors carry on like that, they will be muted. Now, if we're going to move forward, whenever we've got a meeting, the chair should be respected. Now, we're moving on. We've moved, we've moved on. We're on uh, item eight. Uh, is, there, is there anybody else who wants to make a comment on this item on the agenda? Councillor Ogilvie. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I have to say I welcome the thrust of this uh, this report. Um, but I have just one, one or two concerns. Um, a lot of this will depend on the, the, the culture of the organisation to be able to change to get into a more performance management attitude. We know that when we changed risk management from, I can't remember what the old system was, but into um, GRACE, it stuttered a long time because there was difficulties with people accepting a different way of working. And I'm just wondering, have we sort of learned from that experience and are we going to need additional training for people are we going to need additional resources for all these reviews and checks that are going to take place? Um, so that's the concern I've got. But in terms of the general thrust of what you're trying to do here, I, uh, I welcome it. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's what we're discussing tonight, the general thrust of it. I mean, the delivery of it will be the responsibility of the chief executive and other officers. Thanks for that. Any others? Councillor Michael Green. Councillor Michael Green on this item on the agenda. The report sets out that there will be a role for scrutiny in assessing the quarterly performance um, moving forwards and, the, and in assessing um, performance focus reports on a quarterly basis. Um, could we have confirmation, please, from the Cabinet that these reports will go to the full scrutiny committee for consideration? The, uh, the, the commitment is there that it will go to sc the scrutiny. It will be for scrutiny to decide who it goes for, who it goes to, and uh, who, who considers it. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. The, the, if the council has established the, the working group from the scrutiny committee, chaired by the scrutiny committee chairman, that does the budget and performance monitoring, and that's how we will be staying, unless the chair of the scrutiny committee or council decides otherwise. No, okay. Uh, well, can we uh, move that, that, that report? Accepted? Accepted? Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. well, I mean, it is it is written down. I mean, I'll, I'll 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 finish the last paragraph. Information is exempt to the extent that, in all the circumstances of the case, the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. Information is not exempt if it relates to proposed developments for which the local planning authority may grant itself planning permission pursuance of Regulation 3 of the Town and Country Planning General Regulations 1992A. Can I have somebody to move that? Moved, Chair. Okay. Seconded? Yeah. Okay. Well, we have to say goodbye for anybody who is still with us from the public. Uh,